so before we get to our esteemed guests, um, I want to do a little bit of a setup uh, just to sort of get, put this in context and also explain the project a little bit. Because what we want to do tonight is really um, focus a little differently than we're used to doing. Uh, this project itself, uh, the, the video project that Striking Voices, that I'm the director of, produced um, is called 1300 Men. Mike closer. Okay, so we have to really, we're going to have to move this around a lot. Okay. Um, it's called 1300 Men, but tonight we're going to be talking about three women and more. Okay. <laughs> um, as Daphne mentioned, um, you know, I, I, I come by this uh, through some, some uh, family ties. But also, I want to mention that uh, Ben and Francis Hooks were dear friends of our family. And they came to our house. And I grew up with them being around the dinner table. And I want to mention Francis Hooks. Uh, you all probably know something about Ben Hooks. But his wife was an amazing force mm -hmm. and a wonderful woman, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, she, she, as a child, she had a special place for, uh, in my heart because she would always come over and talk to me right? And <laughs> she was always very concerned with children and, and just a lovely, lovely human being. So I sort of want to dedicate this night to her as well. All right. Um, yeah, let's, let's give Francis a, a big. Um, so my father, and I'll, I'll just give you a little bit more background on that. My father and, and Reverend Hooks were, were, as I said, friends, but they were also colleagues. Um, right after the assassination, my father went to the head of Channel 5 at the time, Maury Griner, and, and pointed out that they did not have any African Americans on television in Memphis speaking about issues. And so he created a show called 40% Speak. It only ran for five months. At that time, Memphis was 40% black. And he had one week he would have uh, Reverend Hooks, and the other week he would have Reverend Lawson. And they did about five months' worth of shows every week. And it was the first time in Memphis history that African Americans were on television speaking about issues in this city and talking about public affairs. And so I'm very proud of that. And I feel like that is a connection to tonight as well. And Reverend Hooks, as you know, went on to become head of the FCC, the Federal mm -hmm. Communications Commission. Uh, and he also was the national head of the NAACP. So again, this is, this is wonderful ground that we're on tonight. And I just wanted to point that out. Um, and I'll just tell you one more thing briefly about the Striking Voices Project and where it came from. Daphne mentioned it. But um, about five days after the strike, my parents, as journalists, my father started the film and television department here at University of Memphis, uh, just realized and knew that this story was not being covered in the Memphis press. Part, not all, but part of why this happened was the ignorance of fellow citizens about the conditions that our fellow citizens lived in. And my parents set out um, about five days after there was a meeting in our living room. I was there, I was six. And um, there was a meeting where they got together and said, what can we do as journalists, as, as you know, uh, people who c care about this? And they ended up, it's a long, it was a long road, but they ended up doing a five-year uh, project it was an oral history, but most oral histories, if you know anything about it, were done, are done 30 years later. They started interviewing people a month later. So we have interviews from Mar May 1968. There's 13 hours of interviews with James Lawson that started in July 1968 through 1971. It was funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. It was one of their first projects. And all of that, it's a huge collection. And I'll tell the family joke, and I think this crowd will appreciate it. Um, they interviewed 150 people involved in the sanitation strike. Uh, there's 400 hours of audio tape interviews. And audio tape was a you know, big technology back then. My father had a tape recorder and a microphone. Um, and so we always joke that they interviewed 150 people involved in the sanitation strike, everybody from Mayor Loeb on up. <laughs> right? <laughs> um, 
And so that's what I grew up with, and I grew up with that around me. When I became a journalist in my own right and started writing about the South, just very luckily, th for the New York Times, in 1998, um, I see Aurelia Kyles is here, and the Kyleses created the pilgrimage to Memphis, which was the sort of big celebration, or not celebration, but commemoration of that time. And they asked me to write about the strike, and I wrote a 10-page uh, uh, summary of the strike, and I interviewed two strikers, Taylor Rogers and Clinton Burroughs. Mm -hmm. And I really heard I mean, I'd heard things, but I hadn't heard it from the men themselves. And that's when I said, you know what? This story, as, as much work as my parents did, they didn't do this. And that's what I'm going to do. And they were still alive. They knew I was doing it. It was kind of cool. So I, st I started thinking about it, and it took 20 years, basically, to get it done. And in 2015, we started in earnest, and we started interviewing. And we have interviewed 30 men, their wives, and their families. And before the event, you saw a slideshow. And Darius uh, B. Williams, a local photographer, hugely talented. He'll be here soon. Uh, he, Everybody we interviewed, he took these beautiful portraits of. And um, yeah. Yeah, and there was an exhibit at the library, and then we gave the portraits to the families. So we have a beautiful one of y'all. <laughs> um, so I'm very proud of all of this, but this, even though I'm talking a lot, it's not about me at all, and I'm always really clear about that. This is about a story that um, comes from Memphis, but it's a story that's really about the condition, human condition in the world. And before I introduce our panel, I'm, I'm really building it up here, I'd like to read you one thing. Um, oh, the only other thing I want to say is on the root.com, it's called 1300 Men. It's a 10 part series. Each video is about six minutes. You can go there right now and watch it. Watching it on Facebook is the best way because it um, automatically plays the next one. If you go on Facebook and just type in 1300 Men, there it is. Um, I worked with an amazing woman at the root named Kirsten West Savali. She's now she's now at Essence, and she's a dear, dear friend for life of mine. Um, so I'm going to read you what she wrote about the women on right before we played the video of the women. We we ran this series uh, from Martin Luther King Day to April 16th, the last day of the strike, and that we corresponded during that time with days of the strike. So the first day of the strike, we, we had a video about the first day of the strike and on like that. So the one about the women was around this time last year. And so I want to read you uh, what she wrote. And it, it'll take a second, and then I promise we're going to get to the main attraction. <laughs> um, and I know y'all are kind of nervous, but is this, is this calming you down a little bit, not to have to talk at first? <laughs> All right. Well, you can just listen now, okay? And this is what Kirsten wrote. It was, we, we, she wrote a preview of every video. She sort of wrote her own reactions. And she's a brilliant writer. She's very um, much of this moment. And I, I just, I, I couldn't think of a better way to introduce this all. All right, so this is Kirsten, not me. During the 1968 Memphis sanitation strike, there were no, no signs that read, I am a woman, or I am a wife, or I am a mother. The wives of sanitation strikers were given no awards for their tireless contributions to the struggle, but they should have been. Sanitation strikers consulted with their wives before making the decision to walk off their jobs because they understood that these women, their partners in life and revolution, held their households together through sheer will and a deep commitment to their families. The strikers knew that liberation wouldn't happen without their wives because their wives' eyes were trained on freedom. And in doing so, these women gave their husbands permission to dream of freedom too. The wives provided emotional shelter for their beautiful black children who were mocked and ridiculed for being the garbage man's kids and they made sure they knew love. When the world told these children in both big and small ways that they didn't matter, their mothers told them that the world was a damn lie. <laughs> these women watered and protected seeds that society was hell bent on destroying, and each and every day they woke up and did it again. Though the road was tough, they loved their husbands fiercely and still do today. 
They took pride in being their wives, creating families that were able to withstand the vicious blows of white supremacy that rained down on them. In the midst of it all, they created joy together that has lasted decades. Still, it, admit, it must have taken so much strength to support the men in their lives, the loves of their lives, through the storms. It couldn't have been easy tending to men who felt as if their manhood, defined by the ability to take care of their families, had been denied them. Nor could it have been easy for these women, these wives, these mothers, to crease and fold their own pain and put it high on the shelves with the laundry. Still, they loved and fought within society's racist, gendered restraints and created something beautiful each and every day, and you can see it in the way their husbands and children's look at, children look at them. These women, the proud wives of Memphis sanitation strikers, didn't do anything audacious enough to be placed in history books, though they created Women on the Move for Equality Now <laughs> to support the sanitation strikers. It did not garner widespread support and attention, though they made sure their husbands were fed and strong enough to stand on the front line. They didn't get any recognition for the movement work they did in their homes day in and day out. Not that they expected it. They did what they did because they felt they were born to do it. And in them, I see the words of poet L Lucille Clifton embodied. And this is a poem that Kirsten included from Lucille Clifton. So this is, hang on, let me make sure. Yeah. This is the poem. Won't you celebrate with me what I have shaped into a kind of life? I had no model. Born in Babylon, both non-white and woman, what did I see to be except myself? I made it up here on this bridge between starshine and clay my one hand holding tight my other hand, come celebrate with me that every day something has tried to kill me and has failed. This women, this is Kirsten again. This Women's History Month, we are not applauding these quiet, uh, uh, we are not applauding these quiet revolutionaries for their sacrifices because they wouldn't view their actions that way. They loved hard, they prayed hard, they fought at their husband's side, reimagining new futures for their families. And they did these things because they chose to do so, because they watched their husbands make a dollar out of 15 cents every day, <laughs> because they understood their husband's love language, even when no words were spoken at all. We are celebrating these women, these wives, these matriarchs, these warriors for surviving and making sure that everyone around them survived too. We are celebrating their beauty, their courage, and the fullness of their humanity. We are letting them know that we see them, and we want you all to see them too. Okay, so first of all, y'all, I, I am very uh, close to these women, if I may say so myself. and. Um, so you'll notice that we kind of talk like that. But I'd like y'all, and starting with you, Mrs. Leach, if you want to bring that microphone close to you, I'd like you to introduce yourselves. <laughs> I'd like you to introduce yourselves and point out your family members in the audience, if you don't mind, Mrs. Leach. You're going you're gonna to have to bring it. See how close I am? Like right up on it. Yeah. My name is Jimmy Leach. I'm the wife of Bastard Leach, and that's my family sitting over there. <laughs> it might be easier if we just say, could the whole Leach family stand up? <laughs> if we have the audience. My name is Florence Ewell, and my husband and my two sons are here with me. Can y'all stand up? All right, Ms. Turner, it's all on you. 
My name is Helen Turner, and I was the wife of Alvin Turner, and I have my family members here with me. Okay, so this is a family thing, y'all, and we're just going to treat it that way. So what I want to do to start, to warm us up, because I have been told individually by each of the women up here that they feel a little nervous. So why don't we watch the video, and that'll be them, you know, talking, and then we'll come back, and I have some questions. And what we're going to do is we're going to talk, watch a video. We got, we got three, maybe four. We'll see how it goes. And then we're going to talk for, for a while. And then we'll open it up to questions, but that's going to be way at the end. So just sit back, and we're going to turn off the lights if we can with the first video. Um, and I hope you can see over our heads. Um, y'all be careful here. This is, there's logistics issues. Can y'all see over our heads? Okay. All right. And um, so this is the first video. It's called The Wives, and it's the sixth video in the series. But I thought it was the first one to show tonight. So I probably watched that a hundred times, and every time Miss Yule says, you didn't probably hear the rest of it, she says, uh, he, was, he was my man, and I love him dearly. And every time I hear that, I get a little lump. Oh. <laughs> um, so there you have it, all right? Um, I just wanted y'all to react. Maybe just, um, again, starting with you, Mrs. Leach. Just, just what do you think when you hear that, and what, what, kind of, what kind of thoughts does it bring to your mind when you, when you see that? Well, it brings joy. And uh, I would think, you know, uh, how far they came and how they stood up and where they are today. So it's a joyful feeling. Yeah, it's a joyful feeling to help you. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so I'm very godly proud of it. Miss Ewell, what about you? As being the wife of a sanitation worker, my husband, I'm proud of what he did. He, he did what he knew was right to do. He did to make sure that the family was taken care of. And I'm just happy all over just to know that he's still my man. Uh, I was proud to be a part of the women who were backing their men. <laughs> and it was, even though it was scary, uh, mm -hmm, it was an exciting time. And for most of, most of the men, this was the only major attention they had ever received. So they were proud too. I mean, they were concerned about how their families were going to be taken care of during this period, mm -hmm. but they were also proud. Mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. So I think it would be good um, to hear a little bit about just the daily lives during the strike. We'll get into other things, but just the real simple things, um, and I'm gonna, I'm, I, know, I happen to know some of these stories, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna maybe prompt you a little bit. Miss Ewell, I wanted you to uh, tell us, when I, when I interviewed you, you talked about how you were the one who managed the money in the house. Mm -hmm. I don't think a lot of people think about that, but when you're uh, going through a strike and you don't have a lot of money, <laughs> and maybe even before that, you're not making a lot of money when you did, when you were working, you had to manage that. And you mentioned it in the video, but could you talk a little bit more about what that meant on a day-to-day -day basis? Like, what did, you, what did you have to do, if you don't mind sharing that with us? Well, on a daily basis, uh, not having much money coming in, to me, it wasn't necessary to go out and buy stuff I didn't need. I had kids to feed. I had a husband that was out struggling to make ends meet. And as a wife, 
I, like I said, I always believe in being by my husband's side. If it was something that needed to have been have done, I was there to help him to help him through it. I went with him at one time with the strike, and it was horrible. Yeah, we'll we'll get to that one. Yes, ma'am. We'll get to that one. But. but you, you said to me when we talked, you said that he brought home the money and you managed it. Is that right? I did. I owned above what was necessary to feed the family, to pay the bills. And you had to do that for a long time. I did, but I handled it. <laughs> there you have it. Um, now, Ms. Leach, uh, you worked at a laundry during the strike, right? You worked, and, and tell us about that and, and what that job was. You were working most of the strike. Yes, I was, and uh, the job that I had, it paid very little. I think about 63 cents an hour, something like that. But it was enough for me to bring home and help take care the bills and put food on the table and keep a roof over our head. So we made it. And what were you doing at this laundry? I was a censure and a silk presser. A silk presser? Mm hmm And a seamstress? Yes. And whose clothes were you fixing up? Uh, everybody in the neighborhood. <laughs> <laughs> Preachers, pimps. <laughs> that pretty much covers it, I think. Yeah. <laughs> All right, then. Um, I know when I used to ask you, Miss Leach, you know, what, what were your memories of the strike? You said that really you were just working. Like, how long were you working every day? Uh, eight, about eight hours. Okay, but mm -hmm. then you had to come home and work at home too. To yeah, we, the, uh, until the kids got big enough to help I come home and keep the house clean, cook, whatever necessary to be done in the home. And can you talk about when your husband came home in his in his clothes that he had worn for the day? Well, let me just let me just give a little setup. I, I'm sure a lot of you all know this, but for those of you who don't, there were no showers available for the men, and they had to wear their own clothes. And they came home often with the garbage and the days of worth of garbage all over them, and they talked about having maggots and that sort of thing. So. If you could talk, Ms. Leach, about what, what the routine was when your husband got home from work. Well, I did not experience the maggots. Good. <laughs> he never came home with maggots on him. I don't think I could have took it. But uh, he wore his regular clothes, and he would be dirty and sometimes smelly. But other than that, I, don't, I didn't experience that right. bad part of that. Ms. Turner? Or Ms. Yule, did y'all did y'all have any experience you want to share about that? Ms. Yule, you go. Yes, I do. <laughs> My husband would come home smelling. At the time, he had long hair. He would have maggots in his hair. Because uh, when he would come in, I would, you know, check his hair. They would be up there. I'd comb them out. He would go and, uh, you know, uh, wash his hair take a bath, and I had him clean clothes when he got home to put on. And I would take those dirty clothes and wash them. Ms. Turner, um, let me ask the question. Um, you talked in that video about women, women on the move for mm -hmm. equality now. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about what that group was and, and what you did with that group? Uh, this group was to support no. Uh, our, our, the, the men who were on strike and we met at Claiborne Temple. Uh, it, it was almost like we had jobs because if we'd get there in the morning, we'd be there all day. And we were a strong group. We really were. Who, who was this group? These were women, uh, wives, 
family members of the sanitation workers who were on strike. And then there was a lot of community backings that we had, that they had. Uh, so there were a lot of community people, politicians. What uh, would you do each day? At the meetings, talk, <laughs> sing, pray. Uh, they had a lot of backing, ministers, politicians. Did you do any, like, sorry, we're, we're sharing a mic here. Did you do any uh, organizing or, or did you give out food or anything like that? There was some organizations. Um, there were certain groceries, bread companies, and other um, neighborhood businesses who donated to the strikers, and that was given out and things like that. Churches donated. Uh, some of the strikers were given individual money, and some of them, you know, it was divided between church members and, you know, things like that organization. So they got a lot of bagging. They, they really did. Right. Uh, okay. So now I want to just switch gears a little bit. We're going to keep talking, don't worry. Um, but just to give them a little break, uh, we're going to show the video about the children and some of, some of the children, who are my age, um, <laughs> and uh, are, are in, the, in the audience now. But I think this is a really important part of what we're talking about tonight. Um, and this is a video where I, was, I, was really, I thought it was really important to document the family life and to make sure that we captured that. And I was six years old and when this happened, and I have memories, and I know uh, some, of, some of the children, you know, those memories, they shape you for life. And so if you can just think about it that way. And the other thing I wanted to mention about these videos real quick is all of the footage you see from 1968 is the footage that my father went to all of the TV stations and got them to give the film. So there's 25 hours of film at the University of Memphis that wouldn't be there. It'd be thrown away. And so we were able to use that extensively. So when you see all of this marching and all of the, that, that beautiful shot of the woman with her kids walking down the street, those kinds of things are in there. And it's just, it's, it's a gold mine. So um, I just want y'all to make note of that when you're watching this. But this is the one about the children. Y'all will be signing autographs after, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, so, um, Ms. Turner, you, you told me a story when we talked about after the strike, your, your children went to campus school right here. Right. Um, and you had to, you rode the bus with them. Can you tell us, like, how they were, cho how they ended up going to campus school, that when it, you know, and, and how you got them to school? Okay. They were, okay, I had two of my daughters, I have three daughters, I have four children, and two of my daughters uh, <laughs> were, uh, okay, were recommended by the principal at uh, Nari School to, uh, well, first of all, let me say, uh, the campus school was affiliated with Memphis State, and even though it was affiliated with Memphis State, it was it was supposed to have been a public school. And when people found out what was happening with Memphis State, because they were only they were mostly accepting children of professors or uh, right and people who worked at Memphis State. And it was stated that if they weren't open to the public, as a public school, they were going to defund them. So, uh, but then they were still selected, selective of students who they wanted in. And principals, I guess they were the first to know or first to find out what was happening. So they started uh, 
they picked your your two kids. Yes. And you tell them how you got to got them to school. We rolled the bus. We why? rolled the bus. Why? Why did you? Because we only had one car, and uh, of course, my husband used the car to go back and forth to work. So we would ride the bus, and until they, they were what second and third grade, third and four. Okay, they were little children. So uh, of course I would have to. I would ride the bus, and sometimes the bus drivers were nice enough to know that. You know we were just making a round trip. And some of them wouldn't charge us a coming back fee and stuff like that. But it just happened that people were so intrigued with these two little girls after they started going by themselves, riding the bus, that it was like they had uh, another set of parents or neighbors or whatever because they looked out for them. And they, in fact, they were the only two of my children who really learned how to ride the bus. Uh, and when one of them, because at that time they only went to sixth grade, I think. Right. Uh-huh. And when that one left, I felt that the younger one would come back to regular school, but she didn't want to, so she rode the bus by herself. <laughs> <laughs> and they did well at campus. Well, and that that's just an example of the kinds of things that you had to do just to get your kids mm -hmm. uh, we won't even talk about what's happening in now with privileged parents, but mm -hmm. I, I think it's really important to say that school was such an important part of all of this and the way that kids were treated at school. Um, so I want to, I'm going to move us along and y'all will have time to ask questions, I promise, but I just want to kind of cover as much as we can. Um, Ms. Ms. Leach, I, I'd like you to go back a little bit to your high school and um, Ms. Leach had a, had a career in high school. Uh, you want to tell them what, what sport you played? Basketball. <laughs> <laughs> and how did that come to be, and where were you? T tell us where you grew up and all of that. I grew up in Slaughter, Mississippi. Went to Sam Barkin, graduated from Sam Barkin High School. And tell us how you got into basketball and what your what your well, my uh, principal wanted me to play because I had to hike. And during my high school years, I had a lady from Charleston, Massachusetts, which was a white lady that helped me all the way through high school because I was picked by the principal again. And did y'all win? Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> we was number one. What did you play? Forward. <laughs> and um, Miss Miss Ewell, when you watched the video of the children and heard heard the children talking, what what kind of memories did that bring back for you? Well, when I was uh, in school. I didn't go through anything like this. Uh, we lived in the country, and I didn't, we, I didn't have a problem going to school. We rode the bus uh, to school backwards and forwards, and I had no problem. You look like you're having a press conference. And just <laughs> <laughs> that mic is not working. Yes, this mic is. Like I said, I had no problem going to school. Uh, we rode the bus backwards and forwards. We're going to have to just pass it. Yeah. You can probably hear me. Can y'all hear me? Yes. Okay. I'm going to just not do the mic for a while. All right. Um, so I know that uh, Miss, Miss Ewell and Miss Turner, y'all were born in the country, but you moved to Memphis pretty quickly, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, Miss Leach, you, you worked. Um, if, you could, if you could tell us about your childhood and when you started working. And if you could bring that second mic here, I'll bring it over. I'm going to try not to fall off the stage either. Okay, got it. I started working at the age of six in the country. We was farmers. 
And uh, how uh, at the time when you was a little child, they had uh, croaker sacks. I don't know what you all know about croaker sacks. So we used to, that's what I used to put cotton in, pick cotton. And I, st I lived in the country, well, I came to Memphis in 58. And uh, my granddad and grandmother, they was old, and I really had to do, work the crop myself almost. So finally I told them I wasn't working it anymore. <laughs> so we began to work by the day. Not make it, making much money. Not really, you know, sometimes you don't even know how, what bad a shape you're in. <laughs> we were happy. So I decided to come, I got married and decided to move to Memphis. Uh, who do I think was hero? All of them. They were they were all heroes because they all stuck together. They didn't give up. And uh, your husband's here right now. Is he a hero? Yes. <laughs> Um, and, and Ms. Ewell, what, what do you say, what do you say about that? My husband, he was a hero, because he didn't give up. He stayed and he fought for what he knew was right to do. He knew, like I said, he had a family, and he was determined that he was going to be able to feed his family and pay our bills. I have a question, though. Some people might say that you were a hero. What do you say to that? I just did what I had to do. <laughs> Ms. Turner, what do you think about all this? I think um, with all the threats, and believe it or not, there were threats of, of, of bodily harm and things like that that these men were getting, they still stuck it out. Mm -hmm. They really did. Mm -hmm. And I think they, they became heroes to Memphis for sticking it out. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay, and I have, I have one last question that I wanted any of y'all that feel like answering it and then we'll open it up for the Q&A. Um, there are people now trying to affect change and being <coughs> activists, and some people in this audience are, are in that work right now. You all have this wisdom. What, what would you say, and I'll start with you, Ms. Turner, what would you say to people now who are trying to change things, you know, about race, about economy, <coughs> the economy, you know, the economic inequality and social change, which is what this institute is about, what would you say to them? What, what's your words of, of wisdom for them? In a lot of instances, I feel uh, change <coughs> has to be <coughs> of, uh, affected through sacrifice. And I think back in, the six, back in 68, I think that's what those men did. Uh, to get decent wages and working conditions and things like that, it was worth it. And uh, they were together. And that was one thing that I, I really, when I think back about it, I really admire. They were together and they affected change. Would that be your advice, stick together? Yes, stick together. <laughs> We want to hear from you too. 
No, as as life go on now, there will be changes. And you got to be able to stick with the change because everything that we go after or we want, we don't always get. So when we do get an opportunity to, you know, make work with things to change, we change with it. Because other than that, if you don't change when things are supposed to change, you just make a big mess. Mine is very short. Never give up on your dream. All right, well, if you thought we had logistical problems up here, we're going to have some interesting uh, challenges down there, too. So um, I'll leave it to Amy. Can you tell us what we're supposed to do here with mics and things like that? Um, If you could stand up and ask the question, and then I'll repeat it if we need to. Yeah. Okay? Who's got a question tonight? Oh, we got one right here with a little boy. I okay. wanted to know, uh, were you guys for or against the strike? When the hurricane was with the strike, were y'all with it or what? Well, I wasn't so much in, you know, for the strike, but that's what it led up to be. So as my husband was out there, I stayed home and took care of the family. I even tried to go with him because I've been the type of wife to, you know, whatever my husband attempt to do, I've always felt that, you know, I should be a part. I was a part of it. But that strike, that one day I went, I said, honey, look, I say. You do what you have to do, <laughs> and I'll stay home and tend to the family and pray that the Lord will send you back in one piece back to us. And the, I just want to add, the day, that you went, the day that you went to the strike was the day that you marched with Martin Luther King, right? And that they, they did the tear gas in Claiborne Temple. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, they tear gas with some else. Yeah. That's, it was awful. Your eyes burning. And again, I told him, I said, you can't take care of yourself. And me too. I said, it's too much to put on you. I said, I'll stay home and make sure the family's okay. And we hope that you will home, be home soon. So in a way, your sacrifice, your, your way of, of handling was staying home so that he could do what he had to do. Do what he had to do. Right, right. <laughs> Thank you. you. Worrying about me and him. Right. Okay, I see you right there. Um, so I'm, I'm hearing the stories of how you stood through, you know, all the trials and the bears. So I would ask for what advice do you have for those coming behind you or weathering the storms in the middle? Ooh. Um, the question is, what advice do you have for weathering the storms in your marriage? You mean if you're being an activist? Or you just mean you're trying to get some you're trying to get some uh, Dr. Ruth Oprah advice here. <laughs> that might be a whole nother. Uh, <laughs> Who wants to take that one real quick? Who wants to take that one? <laughs> Nobody. <laughs> Miss Miss Leach, you gonna you gonna you gonna try it? Well, first of all, her husband's sitting right there, y'all. <laughs> uh, uh, if you really love each other, all right, all right. you have to, you grow together. And the first thing, a lot of time in marriage, each one try to mold the other into what they want them to be. But it's a growing mm -hmm. thing. You grow into it marriage and you know since I know better you have to pray a lot too <laughs> and the respect you have to have respect for your husband be obedient to your husband Well, I'm just going to say 
that we don't want to veer off into a subject that's not quite what we're here for. So we're going we're to end it there. Yeah, we're going to end it there. Does anybody have a question that's relevant to the subject of the wives of the sanitation workers? <laughs> There's a question right there. Um, back to the children. Um, did any of your children have start going to work to bring home extra money? Did they go live with other relatives? I mean, were there ways in which the children tried to help out? Well, my children were too young. Yeah, most too of them. Young. Mine were. Sorry. My children were too young also, so. Okay. They uh, continued in school and things like that, community activities. We tried to keep things pretty normal for them as children. They knew what was going on. And they even enjoyed going to the meetings because they were pretty active too. And also the, the uh, school strike. Right. You know. Yeah, and, and some of the leeches are saying they went to the marches because they marched, even uh -huh. though, My yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, also, I just want to point out with Mrs. Leach here, um, you know, she's an entrepreneur. She has run three restaurants uh, right now. If you could just, if you could just briefly tell them how you started your first restaurant, um, I think it's a, that's an instructive thing too. And Miss Leach is the one who started it. So female entrepreneurs, listen up. <laughs> well, <laughs> I started the business in uh, 85. I was working at Herbert Lawn, it was uh, uh, Quality Quick Cleaners. And uh, uh, you started making cakes. Yeah, yeah. I began to bake cakes. Uh, my son had uh, be became a pastor, and I began to bake cakes to build a church because we was in a little shotgun house. Mm. When it rained, we had to set buckets out. <laughs> so I figured God had more than that for us. So I began to sell cakes, and uh, he took them on his job. And I think we I sold about five thousand dollar worth of cake mm. to start the uh the uh the building. So I said, mm. I said, I think I'll open up me a bakery since the cakes did so well. So I asked uh, uh, across the street with a man named Grover and my daughter went and asked, uh, do you have a my mom trying to open up a bakery? What about the building across the street? He told her, I don't know about the, a bakery, but it was a restaurant. So I looked in it. We looked in it. I took a shot at it. Didn't have any money. It was a little melon right across the street. Uh, <laughs> Y'all can still taste it, right? <laughs> well, <clears throat> I had uh, $8,000 on, not $8,000, no. 800 dollars on a credit card. That's how I opened up Melanie's with that credit card. And since then, there's been two others, and now you're running Miss Gurley's yeah. at, at uh, 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 Thomas and Chelsea. Chelsea, yeah. And get there early, because there's a long line. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we have any other questions? Yeah? Did any of you hear Dr. King's last speech? Yes, yes. Didn't all of y'all? Weren't y'all there? Were you there? I weren't no, there. No, you weren't there, but the two of y'all. The last night, the last time uh, he made that speech, we was, I was, I and my husband, we was there at the place. It was, place was packed. Mm -hmm. No seats, no more room standing around the wall. And that speech Dr. King made, you could just like feel that something on the inside of him was, was going to happen. It rained, it stormed like you've never seen the storm before. That was the awful speech that he made that night. So um, because you said that, we're going to play the last video after Ms. Turner talks. It's called The Mountaintop. It's about that speech. So.
you go ahead and tell your, your experience a little bit, just and then we'll get into it. I was at the last uh, speech that he made, too. And I don't know. I, I think the crowd, and the, it was a crowd. I mean, the church was filled to its capacity, and, and people were standing around on the outside. I think the crowd felt that they didn't know what was going to happen, but I think they felt uh, something was going to happen. And it was just like people knew this was it. And I don't know, it was just, it was an eerie feeling. Uh, nobody knew what was going to happen, but everybody knew something was going to happen. And it was just, I don't know, I had feelings that I had never felt before. Uh, and, and, and they have never experienced. It was, it was like I say, it was, it was just an eerie, it was an eerie night. Can you describe one of those feelings? I can't. I, I really can't. Was I, it fear or? It wasn't fear, but it was just knowing that, uh, wondering what was going to happen. That's right. One of the things that uh, you said to me when I asked you what the hardest thing about the strike, you said, was the uncertainty. Because mm -hmm. it went on for 65 days, <laughs> yes. and you didn't know you didn't know the outcome. No, we didn't. And you didn't you didn't imagine this outcome. So, mm -hmm. what we'll do real quick. This is a six-minute video. We'll play the video call. This is the ninth one. It's called the Mountaintop, and this is um, about the last. I think even though this happened in 1968, I, I think uh, we are adults. I think we should share this with our children, our children's uh, children, and whoever. Because for the, what was it, 1,500? 1,300. 1,300 men who were considered nothing really the lowest men on the totem pole to have the courage to go out and start the movement because I think it was a start <laughs> of a movement that they did uh, I think this is a story that needs to be told and shared with our children and our children should <laughs> from you. This is the story to the young people to not to never give up on what you believe is right and do that is right. Thank you. I'll just say keep the dream alive. Then together we can make things happen. I just want to thank all of the women. Can we give them a standing ovation? <laughs> and I'm going to say it if you weren't, uh, y'all are my heroes. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, everybody.